Well, good morning. My name is Stephen. We're in Matthew chapter 18 today. If you have a Bible, you can go ahead and open up to it. We've been in a series since the beginning of the year entitled Discipline. It's a Greek word, paideia. And what we've been trying to do is understand what does godly biblical discipline look like in our lives. And we've been doing that for three reasons. One, because it helps us to obtain godliness. Secondly, because it teaches us how to deal with problems biblically. And third, uh, because it produces healthier lives, healthier relationships, and a healthier church. Now, Matthew 18 predates the passage of Hebrews. And so actually what we're doing is we're jumping back and we're looking at what Jesus taught on this subject before the writer of Hebrews even got to write his part. Now, the overall uh, tele or point of this passage of scripture is the preservation of the integrity of Jesus's church. And it's important that we understand from the beginning why Jesus spoke these words. He spoke these words because he loves his church. He spoke these words because he loves the people who are in his church and he wanted to see it preserved. And Jesus, because he's smart, he looked in and he saw the church being developed throughout the years and he could foresee something. Church drama. What a smart guy. Maybe Jesus knew that if a bunch of people got together at some point in time, they wouldn't always agree. Now, it can be as simple as you had to go to the bathroom and you didn't say hi to somebody on your way out of church or you were supposed to bring a snack to life group and you didn't. And so you get blamed and someone else is hungry and gets mad and your life group blows up over guacamole. (laughs) Fergie said it best. We don't want no drama. No, no drama. And today we're going to talk about how Jesus looked in and saw broken humanity and taught, if you do it this way, the conflict can create community, not chaos. But where you don't, (laughs) chaos will happen. Now, at the end of this little passage, there is a beautiful phrase that Christians quote all the time. You know what it is? Where two or three are gathered, there I am also. It's great. It's a good part of scripture. We often take it out of context. The point of the passage is when Christians persevere through difficulty and then begin to pray out of it, there's great power in it. That was the point of the passage. Let's look at it. If your brother, it starts like that. If your brother, see Jesus operated off an assumption and here was the assumption that your fellow attenders or your fellow people in a church, they're not fellow attenders. They're not fellow club members. They're not just somebody else who shows up on a Sunday morning with you. Jesus's whole perspective on the church was that it operates as a family. Now, where we don't operate church as a family, it actually ceases to be a church. If your brother, if your family member, Jesus spoke. And by the way, brother and sister is the number one word in the scriptures used to define your fellow people in Christ. We say it around here like this. Church is a family, not a social club. In a social club, you hop from one to the next because something changes or something like that. In a family, you stick in regardless of what happens. You're my family. Jesus looked at the church like that. He said, if your brother, if your brother or sister, if your fellow family member. Now there's a parallel passage to this in Leviticus and you know how it ends? Love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, what Jesus was teaching is this. If your brother, your family member gets caught up in sin, you are to treat them in that sin exactly as you would want to be treated if you were in the sin. Because Jesus looked at your sin and treated himself like he was the one who had done it and let you off the hook. So you're to look at your brother in sin and treat them exactly as you would want to be treated if you were caught in sin. If your brother or sister sins, now the early commentators don't even include the words against you in the scripture. That was actually added later. And there's much debate on whether or not it's supposed to be in there or not. But in reality, it actually doesn't matter. Because the rest of scripture teaches us that if your brother sins, whether it's against you or it's not against you, if your brother or sister is caught in sin, we have a responsibility. Now, some of you would say this. We're not supposed to judge. Doesn't the scripture say, don't judge? Not the way you might think it does. 
The scripture says don't judge the unbeliever. We have no right to hold somebody to a biblical standard who doesn't adhere to scripture. So we don't judge the unbeliever. The scripture actually tells us, instructs us in multiple places to judge in a way each other. Now, how do we do that? Well, we start in Matthew 7, and Jesus says, if you go to instruct somebody or to judge somebody, you do it first by evaluating your own heart. See, what we're talking about today is this, God honoring confrontations. God honoring confrontations. And what is essential to God honoring confrontations, by the way, before we get any deeper, is absolute humility on both sides of the equation. Absolute humility. Otherwise, God honoring confrontations don't work. Our pride blows it up. I mean, some of us, we could take our, our spiritual life out of it. I mean, you can't progress in any area of your life because of your pride. Like, no one can confront you ever about anything. In a God-honoring confrontation, though, we both have to be humble. We have to be humble about being talked to and humble about doing the talking. If your brother or sister is in sin, we have a responsibility to them. Why? Because this is what we know about sin. First, sin always leads to death. It always leads to death. Scripture teaches us that. Now, the ultimate death of sin was taken care of by Jesus on the cross. That's great. That's good news. But there's another death, the natural death that sin always produces. Always produces some type of death. It could be a death of trust. It could be a death of um, a relationship. It could be a death of whatever. Sin produces death. And if I see my brother or sister in Christ, in sin, and I know it leads to death, then I have a responsibility to them. Secondly, sin creates division. Sin creates division. When sin gets in, it always divides. And I don't want to see that. We don't want to see that. You don't want to see that with your brother or sister in Christ. Jesus didn't want to see that in his church. And finally, sin destroys. Jesus said it this way, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Lump is a fun word to say. If your brother sins, because sin is so destructive. Here's a word picture we'll come back to throughout this talk. Imagine the family of Christ, the church is over here on this side. And there's a river. And when your brother sins, he got in a kayak and he went to the other side of the river and now he's over there by himself. In a desert wasteland, by himself, all alone. Where death, destruction reigns. And you, you look out and you see your brother over there. And you love him or her. And so you get in the kayak <laughs> for a God-honoring confrontation because you want that brother back on the other side. That's what this is. And Jesus taught this to preserve the integrity of his church because he knew if we don't handle sin right, it will destroy more than it needs to destroy and it will ruin the integrity of his church. If your brother sins against you, Go, let's stop there for a second. Matthew 28, 18, it's the great commission. What's the word? Go. Many Christians will look at that and they'll say, it's the great commission. That's what we call it. And, and so I've been commanded by my, my commander in chief Christ to go and to tell. Well, it's not the only thing that he commanded. If that's the great commission, this is the great confrontation. He says, go. Go, you go. You have a responsibility if you see him in sin. Now, here's the thing. How, what we're talking about today is how do you go? Well, first off, you go with your heart in the right place. You go with your heart in the right place. But you go. Now, here's what Jesus is setting up. He's saying, you see your brother in sin, and so you're going to get in the kayak, and you're going to go across the, the difficult water, right? And it's not easy. You're going to go do the work. And a lot of times, this is what we say. Well, I didn't do anything wrong, so why do I have to go? Well, because he told you to, first. Secondly, because unity means everything to Christ. Listen, listen. The other thing in this too, it says if your brother sins, it does not say if your brother does a little sin, handle it this way. Or on the other side, it doesn't say, um, it doesn't negate certain sins in this process. All sin, small, medium, big, whatever it is. This is the process for all sin, all of it. If your brother sins, doesn't put a caveat on what type of sin it is. Though we like to do that in the natural. If your brother sins against you, go and get him. 
Don't let them stay over there. Go get them back. Now, when I was coaching high school or middle school football, whenever a, draw, a pass fell to the ground, okay, I'd get the water receiver, I'd grab him by his helmet, and I'd say, whose fault is it? And he'd say, the quarterback threw a bad pass. I'd say, no, it's your fault. Catch the ball. Don't let it ever hit the ground. And then I'd send him away. Then I'd bring the quarterback over, and I'd say, whose fault is it? And he said, he dropped it. He said, it's your fault. Don't ever let there be an incomplete pass. Always your fault. That's what Jesus is in a way doing here. He's not blaming us, but what he's saying is, whose responsibility is it when there is sin dividing? You, who didn't do anything wrong. You go create the unity again. Now, in the perfect picture, because Jesus teaches us, when you're taking communion over here on the other side of the island, and you realize you're the only one taking communion because everyone else over there is mad at you, what you're supposed to do is get in your own kayak, and you guys are supposed to meet halfway. If your brother sins against you, by the way, in the scriptures, what is the one sin? Listen, there's one sin in the scriptures that Jesus takes a slight, well, the, the writers of scripture later, so the Holy Spirit, takes a slight caveat on how we're supposed to treat it through the disciplinary process. You know what it is? It's not greed. It's not sex. There's one sin that Jesus says, uh, teach this one a little bit differently. It's division. Division is the only sin that the writers of the scripture say, treat this one differently. All of the other ones, there's a process, but when it comes to division, he says, if you see somebody dividing, you warn them once. And if they don't listen, you get rid of them. The only one that's different. So if you were to ask the writers of the scripture, what's the most grievous sin? Division is the most grievous sin. If your brother sins against you, if your brother's caught up in sin, go and tell him his faults. Now, when you go and tell him his fault, how do you do it? First, your heart is in the right place. Galatians 6 says this, you go and you encourage them, or the actual the word is kind of like counsel them gently. Gently. Which means in your heart, you have had to work through the pain of that sin. You've had to work through your anger at it. You've had to work through that. Ephesians says we can't do anything where anger leads to sin. Anger's not a bad emotion, but when it leads to sin, it's wrong. We can't do it in a way that bitterness comes out of it. Ephesians also tells us that. So when you go, your heart has to be in the right place. What is your heart? That is my brother or sister. I want to, I want to protect their integrity, and I want to protect the church. That's my heart for them. That's my heart for my brother and sister. I want you back on the right side. And so even as you're kayaking over, you're dealing with whatever you've got to deal with. So by the time you hit it, your heart is in the right place. That's a God-honoring confrontation. Your heart's got to be in the right place. Gentle. What are you going to do? You're going to go and tell him. You're going to tell him his fault. Oh, isn't this so much fun? You're going to tell him that he's in sin. You're not supposed to do it that way. You're, you're, you're dishonoring God. You're not pursuing holiness. Now, when you go and tell him his fault, how should you do it? Truthfully. No exaggerations, no lies, no, no um, subjective things stated objectively. You just go and you say, listen, this is what I see. This is what the scripture says. It seems to be inconsistent. I need you to know that. So you go and you tell him or her their sin with as much love and grace as Christ dealt with you. Go and tell him his fault. Your heart has to be right. What else has to be right? Between you and him alone. Okay, your approach has to be right. In other words, it's not just your heart. How you do it matters too. Jesus is not just letting you off the hook by saying, well, my heart was in the right place. Well, I don't care. You didn't do it right. <laughs> what you do matters. How you do it matters. So he says, between you and him alone. Now listen, this is not like a steadfast, ironclad, it always has to be one-on-one -on -one type of rule. That's not necessarily the point of that passage. Here is the point of the passage. The point is, Jesus is looking in at this person over there by himself, in sin or her in sin, and saying, I want that person back, but I don't want that person damaged. Why? Because they're my child. 
So where it's not uh, the law being broke or there's not something dangerous happening, you and I are to seek, this is really what we're supposed to do. Almost like in the cover of night, we're supposed to get over there and I'll get into what happens when you get there. You're supposed to argue with them, get them into the kayak, get back over to the other side and nobody knew they were gone. That is the point. Jesus is saying, get them back over, get them back over and don't let anyone know what happened. Why? Because it'll ruin the integrity of my church and it'll ruin that brother or sister. So go to him alone. Now, where we don't do this, here's the interesting part about engaging in discipline like this. Oftentimes, we engage in discipline like this and we do some things right, but a lot of times we do things so wrong that it actually puts us on the other side of the island. And then someone else like, ah, oh, shoot, he went out for him, but he got screwed up, so now I'll go to them. And I'll say to them, I say, listen, you were doing this right, but now you're a gossip, and that's sin. You were doing this right, but now you're slandering, and that's sin. You were doing this right, but now you're producing division, and that's actually worse. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. In other words, keep it as contained as possible. Protect Jesus' bride. His bride. When you mess with this, you are messing with Jesus' bride. That's a big deal. Between you and him alone, keep it as contained as possible. Make your approach right. Make your timing right. Well, what's the timing? Well, your heart has to get in the right place, or whatever that takes, right? Probably um, quick enough where you don't become calloused, okay? Um, but not so quick that you go there and sin. So whatever between that time. Your heart has to be right. Your approach has to be right. You keep it as small as you can. Now last, your motive has to be right. Your motive has to be right in this God-honoring confrontation. Now most of the time, your motive is revealed, not necessarily in the moment, but afterwards. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Between you and him alone, keep it as close as possible because you love your brother and you want to treat your brother as uh, you would want yourself to be treated. By the way, let's just take this to um, gossip and social media for a second. If there, there are things that your natural brother or sisters, we, we have a natural tendency to want to protect our natural brothers and sisters, right? So if, if your brother or sister does something wrong, here's what you probably don't do about it. You don't go on social media and write poorly about them. You would never do that to your own brother or sister. It means you shouldn't also do it to your own brother or sister in Christ. You wouldn't talk poorly about your brother and sister with people that aren't connected to your family. We don't do that naturally. You ought not to do that with your brother and sister in Christ either. Between you and him alone. Okay, I'm done with that point. Now the motive question. If he listens to you, the thing that is supposed to stop the train is if your brother repents. That's the only motive. The only motive is, did I win my brother? If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. The word gain there is like the word win, and it's like winning an argument in court. And so you're going over there, and you've got your best argument lined up. And listen, listen, I see this, and I see this, and I see this, and I'm being truthful, and I'm being honest, okay? And I've kept this as small as I possibly can because I love you, and I want to protect you, and I just want you to come back to the other side and and, and all of that. And so you go over there, and you lay it out to them in the best case you can. And all you're trying to do is get them to get back in the kayak so you can cross back to the other side. And if you do, the moment you get to the other side, which means your brother has repented, it's over. It's over. It's supposed to stop there. The only time it ever goes on any further is if your brother doesn't repent. 
which means if you get him back over to this side or her and she's repented and you keep talking, you're in sin. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, please don't stay over here. It's not good. You've gained your brother. You won him. You've won. Now put it to rest. Move on. Treat him as your brother. Treat her as your sister. And preserve the integrity of his church. Because then that person comes back over and they, everyone wakes up the next day and they go, I didn't even know you were gone. I didn't even know you were gone. That's great. I must have just missed you. And his church is not affected. It should not be hard for us to see Jesus doing this for us. Each and every one of us chose sin. We were given an opportunity to stay over here. We chose sin. We came all the way over here. We're all by ourselves. And what did Christ do? He didn't just cross a river. He crossed the chasm of the spiritual and the natural. And he came to earth to battle the terrain. And he put his heart in the right place. And he took the approach, the only approach that would work, which was him going to the cross. And his motive was right. All he wanted to do was to win you. He just wanted to win you to himself. And you know what he doesn't do after he wins you? He doesn't treat you differently because of the sin that brought you to the other side. He doesn't hold it against you. He doesn't bring it back up. He left it over there and he brought you over here. And then he points to his heavenly father and he points to you and he says, look, he's over here. He's covered. That's what Christ did for you. As Christ did for you, do for others. And if you see your brother, go, go, go. But protect your brother. Protect his church. If we do this, friends, as a church, if we do this, if we operate in this way, we can stay a family regardless of what happens.